Hey everyone, welcome to this week's Azure update. It's the 18th of April as always. We have our chapters, so you can jump to any update you care about the most. New videos this week. So this video I've been researching for literally months. It's all about quantum computing. So what it is, how it works a little bit, uh, what we can do with it today, but really what it's gonna be able to do in three to five years time, because we're very much at the beginning of practical quantum computing capabilities, but the potential, and now we've got the understanding to be able to scale that quantum computing. So it's gonna be able to do very remarkable things um, in the fairly near future. So basically I go into that, it's an hour and a half long, so it's long, but it's really cool topic, which is why I spent so much time researching it. So even if you don't think you're gonna use quantum computing, I would really recommend watching it and understanding it because it is truly amazing what it's gonna enable us to do. Okay, so onto what's new. On the compute side, so Red Hat OpenShift now has managed identity support. Remember, Azure Red Hat OpenShift provides a fully managed Red Hat OpenShift environment in Azure. And managed identities give me the ability that my Azure resource has an identity that is just provided for it that I don't have to worry about. There's no secret, there's no certificate, like a regular service principle. It's tied to the resource typically. And then if I'm a process within that resource, I can then use that identity to access other resources that would give that identity roles to control its access. Well, now when I have Azure Red Hat OpenShift, it supports that managed identity, which removes that need to have to maintain separate service principles. Now today, it's only when I create a new cluster, I cannot add a managed identity to an existing. Azure Functions, uh, Python 3.9 is being retired end of October, 2025. Basically moved to Python 3.11 or above um, to maintain that support. There's a new set of D and E confidential ESV6 virtual machines. Remember, there are different types of confidential virtual machines, but in this case, these use secure enclaved. So think of it as a separate partition of that computing environment that's protected even from other things within that OS instance. It's always encrypted. So I would write my application to use that secure enclave. So this V6, this is powered by the fifth gen Intel Xeon processors, the Emerald Rapids. And D as always is more of a general ratio of memory to virtual CPUs while the E series is a higher memory. So it's a memory optimized, higher memory to vCPU ratio. Also, we have the new L and the LA V4 series of virtual machines. So these are the storage optimized virtual machines. So when it doesn't have the little A, that means it's the Intel based, based on the Emerald Rapids. And the little A means it's the AMD Epic um, version of this. And the big deal here is they all have local NVMe connected SSDs, which is super low latency. Now, very commonly I'll use that where maybe I use it as some kind of cache, or even that may actually just be where I store the workload. So I would have multiple of these L series virtual machines replicating to each other to make it more durable. Now I'd probably still have some persistent copy in a managed disk or blob or something else, but it actually hosts the workload where I need that super, super low latency. They come in two to 96 vCPU versions. I think the two, the four, and the 96 are new options. You get eight gigabytes of RAM and 240 gigabytes of local NVMe per virtual CPU, which means if you go to that biggest version, that's 23 terabytes of local storage. So pretty huge. There's also the LAO uh, V4 in GA. So this is two to 32 virtual CPUs. It's eight gigabytes of memory, 720 gigabytes of local NVMe disk per vCPU. And this is aimed at distributed high scale workloads, um, storage caching layers, Elasticsearch data warehouses, where you again 
need that massive amount, because remember it's 720 gigabytes of local NVMe now per virtual CPU compared to this, which was 240. So I need a huge amount of that local NVMe storage, but I don't need maybe as much vCPU or memory. So Azure Function SQL Trigger has gone GA. So this is for the consumption plan. I can now trigger my serverless Azure Function when there's some update to a table. So this is really useful. Hey, something's happening, uh, create and insert a delete in my SQL table. I want to go and run some piece of logic I defined in my Azure Function. It also has input output binding. So I could also go and do additional read write actions on my SQL database. Azure Functions also now has MCP support in preview. I did a whole video on MCP last week, the Model Context Protocol. Think of it as USB for AI apps, a standard way for my AI app to talk to those other resources that have knowledge, those various tools that I want to go and do to trigger something, maybe even example prompts. And now I don't have to worry about the specifics of how to talk to that thing. I don't have to worry about or what is it capable of, so I can describe it to my large language model so it knows when to use it. Well, Azure Functions can now act as a remote MCP server. So it will use server-side events, so you, it will get triggered when it gets that server-side event, and then provide that MCP server functionality. So you're just going to declare functions that will now be tools in MCP speak, and then be triggered via the new MCT, MCP tool trigger. There are quick starts available. So in Azure Functions, there will be remote MCPs for Python, Node.js, TypeScript, and Net C Sharp. So it makes it easy to go and get up and running to have those remote MCP servers. Azure Backup for Azure Kubernetes Service now also supports file share support. So if I'm using that as the back end for my persistent volume in AKS, the Azure Backup integration will now also support protecting that data on my Azure file share. It already had Azure Disk support. And the benefit here is when I get the features of the Azure Backup, so I have that instant, instant backup and restore via the snapshots and I get up to 30 days of retention. And then, Azure Container Apps, which remember, sits on Azure Kubernetes Service, but abstracts it away for me, but it adds things like Dapper for better microservice capabilities, Keda for better event-driven auto-scaling. There's some network capabilities. It's really aimed at, hey, I want to host my microservices. Well, now it has native rule-based routing. So I get the incoming request coming, and now just natively in the Azure Kubernetes app, I could route it to different apps, different versions of the app. So that's gonna save me before I might have had to put some kind of proxy in front of it to help split the traffic. And where that's gonna be really useful is imagine, hey, maybe I do have different versions. I wanna do A-B testing. So some of the traffic goes to one, some goes to the other. Maybe it's blue-green. I stand up a brand new app, which has got the new version of the code. I switch it over and the blue-green makes it easy to switch back if there's a problem. Anything where I want to be able to split the traffic in some ratio or whatever, I can now just do it natively with Azure Container Apps and not have to put something else in front of it. On the networking side, so Virtual WAN now has route maps in GA. It's the ability to control the route advertisements and the routing for my Virtual WAN Virtual Hub. So think of it as routing for the traffic that enters and leaves the virtual WAN via my site-to-site -site VPN connections, my end computer user VPN point-to-site connections, and my express route connections, and my virtual network connections. And what I can do with this is I can replace routes. I can even drop routes based on certain criteria. And another benefit of this is imagine there's a huge number of routes it knows. I can actually use it now to summarize the routes if maybe I was facing some limit with the number of routes that could be advertised. For example, for my virtual WAN to on-premises, maybe my on-premises can't handle the number of routes. Well, I could now use this to summarize the routes to reduce the number of individual routes that are sent to that on-premises. Express route metro peering and global reach is available in more regions. Um, so remember, express route circuits is always active-active. So I have a pair of connections 
going to a pair of routers at the Microsoft Enterprise Edge. And the goal of this is, well, if one of those routers fails or a connection fails, I still have the other one. It says maintenance going on. Well, it can take one of them down. It's not interrupting my capability to connect. But those two routers live in the same physical peering location. So while I have protection from a router failure, I don't have protection from the peering location failure. So what Express Route Metro does is it's still a pair, but those pair are now split into two different peering locations within the same city, hence Metro. But it gives me better resiliency now. Think of it almost like availability zones for my peering location. They're different physical facilities, so it increases my resiliency. Now, obviously, the highest resiliency, I would actually have two circuits in two completely different cities with some distance apart. But obviously, then I'm paying for two circuits. There's some additional complexity to make the routing work the right way. But that, that's the best option. Well, essentially, there's new metro locations. So Atlanta, Jakarta, Madrid, and Milan now support metro. And there's also just regular new peering locations, Brussels and Brussels too. And for Express Global Reach, that's where I do have two express route circuits to my two data centers to two different peering locations. And what Global Reach lets me do is my two data centers can talk to each other via the express routes connections to the peering point and then over the Microsoft backbone network. So it provides private connectivity using your express route connections. Well, now I can do that global reach in Belgium, Italy, and Spain as well. Uh, Azure Front Door Custom Cypher Suite has gone GA. So this lets me set the specific Cypher Suite that I want to leverage. When I use TLS, it still negotiates the specific Cypher Suites to use for the various different types of encryption. So maybe if I have very specific requirements, I can tweak via a custom TLS policy the specific Cypher Suites I want it to use. And I can even have different custom policies based on if it's an Azure pre-validated or a non-validated domain and or validated or non-validated DNS services. On the storage side, so Disk Performance Plus has gone GA. So this is for standard hard disk drives, standard SSDs and premium SSDs V1. It's only if its disk is over 513 gigabytes where well, you just basically get a free performance bump. So it's going to improve your throughput and the IOPS. I can only enable it at the time of disk creation today. So if you had an existing disk, you could create a snapshot and then create a new disk from the snapshot and turn it on to get benefit from that. And the new limits are just shown in the star expanded section. So if we open this up super quickly and we just look at one of them. So if I look at my standard hard disk drive, so we're looking at the ones that are over 513, so 513 and above. So for example, this one, we see this expanded IOPS and this expanded throughput. So you can see these are higher numbers than when I don't have that new capability, Performance Plus turned on. So it doesn't cost you anything else. And again, that standard hard disk drive, standard SSDs, see it there, and premium SSDs all now have this nice over 513 and above. I'm going to get that capability. So pay for your new disks, really no downside turning that on. Remember, just because I increased the throughput and the IOPS of the disk, your VM has limits as well. So just pay attention to, okay, I, I'm, I've got better performance on the disk. It's my VM now, the bottleneck. And the nice thing is uh, the Azure Copilot, for example, could help you troubleshoot those things. Uh, Azure Data Lake, i.e. Uh, Azure Storage Account, where I've turned on the hierarchical namespace, the Azure Data Lake Storage Gen 2, now supports vaulted backups. And this means the data is isolated from the source storage account. It means you can also take advantage of things like long-term data retention up to 10 years. I can use features like the multi-user authorization, i.e. a resource guard, where if there was some bad actor and compromised an account, well, even the backup admin could not go and delete your backup if I've turned on the resource guard. I have to go and get another permission granted by a different account before I could go and compromise uh, the integrity of the backup. 
uh, SFTP local users now have access control lists. So for an Azure bot blob, I can enable SFTP. And I have local users. So a local user is specific to the SFTP. It uses a password or secure shell private key for the authentication. Well, now I can get more granular access to the blobs and directories by turning on and using these access control lists focused on those local users that I have created. Miscellaneous. So Azure load testing now supports managed identity and the authentication flow. So as part of the authentication flow between the components and the resources, in the past, there were some odd behaviors it would use. It could bypass some of the proper authentication and therefore, is it a true test? Well, now I can specify the managed identity to use with the test and it will be leveraged. Obviously, when I do that, I need to make sure the managed identity has the required resource access to be able to properly support the test. There is a new Indonesia central region has gone GA. Yes, it supports availability zones. So that's now available to host my workloads. There is a new US government secret cloud region. So remember, US Gov secret is for customers that need the US government classified networks. It operates to the highest US Department of Defense standards. It is secret. And so there's a new region, but it's a secret. So don't know where it is. Stop asking. In fact, forget you saw it. Secret. Uh, GPT 4.1 and its mini and nano variants now available in Azure OpenAI. So these models outperform the previous GPT 4.0 and the GPT 4.0 mini across the board. There's big gains in coding and instruction following. It supports text and image input uh, with a text output. It has up to 1 million tokens of context and just over 32,000, it's 32,768 output tokens. The mini will help reduce latency and cost. The nano is great when I want really fast and cheap responses. So I, I kind of pick depending on, obviously the capabilities, the number of tokens it's using internally gets smaller and smaller, gets it cheaper and cheaper. So I lose some functionality, but even the mini and nano still score really, really highly. And then the O4 Mini and O3 models are now available in Azure OpenAI. So these are the latest reasoning models. Remember, reasoning models are really good at more complex reasoning. They take time. They use internal reason tokens to think about. It has a built-in chain of thought capability to walk through. Well, how do I think about solving this problem? Then solving the problem. So the O3 is the most powerful reasoning model that pushes coding, math, visual perception, science, and much more. And obviously the O4 Mini is a smaller model optimized for faster cost-efficient reasoning. And it's still really good in math, coding, and visual task. But what's interesting about these models is what they're saying is these models integrate the images directly into their chain of thought. They don't just uh, see an image, they think with the image. So if I think about I need to solve a problem with text and images, well, it's blending the visual and textual reasoning together. So you get much better performance when I'm using those multimodal uh, type interactions. And that was it. Um, I hope that was useful. As always, to the next video, take care.